today's talk, I'd like to have it organized in the following way. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and how I came to be doing what I'm doing. Um, and then I'm going to focus on intellectual development in the Autism Phenome Project. Um, now, as Lynn mentioned, intellectual development is really the focus of my lab. And so I thought that I would speak to you about a program of research that we're actively working in now. Um, and that is uh, looking at the development of IQ trajectories over time. So I'm going to present to you two studies in that area. And then a third study uh, where members of our group have looked at the neural correlates of some of those uh, of intellectual development potentially. Um, in the second half of the talk, <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a little uh, update on work coming from the Cognitive Control in Autism Study or COCO Study. Um, and there in particular, I'm gonna focus on our third aim, which is to develop measures of adaptive behavior and functional outcomes. And finally, I'm gonna end my talk um, speaking a bit about the importance of work in the lives of autistic adults. So first off, I'm gonna talk a little bit about me, and actually it's not really about me, but it's about my firstborn son. Um, and here I say that autism was close to home for us. Um, in his first year of life, uh, he was really unique in that if you would put one of those little black and white uh, diagrams that were very popular in front of him, he could sit and he could stare at it for a really long time. Um, he was a member of a developmental nursery. We lived in New York at the time and uh, he really couldn't do a lot of things motorically um, in that first year of life, you know, other than he didn't crawl, but you know, he, he really didn't start to walk or actively furniture cruise till the end of that year. But they called him the little scientist and that's where you see the microscope because he could spend a lot of time, you know, ambulating somehow on his butt uh, largely around the room and looking and examining things. Um, he also was unique in that he liked watching Sesame Street videos and he could do that for long periods of time and then very precociously started to say single words with syllables and by the end of uh, his first year of life. Um, in year two, this pretty much continued, lots of observing, um, lots of talking, uh, a little bit of walking. And then um, we made the decision to move to California. Um, and we were um, in New York visiting my parents on the way to going and saw, um, we were in a Baskin and Robbins. And all of a sudden um, he started to say, no, 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 and point actually. And we realized that he was pointing at a no smoking sign, having read the word no. And from there, we were really curious. We'd been reading a lot to him. We took some books and uh, took a look at the books. And it turned out that by the time he was two, he could read close to 100, 150 words, sight words. He did understand them, but that was a real kind of shock to us, which, you know, of course, led us to believe that he was highly, highly gifted, which he is. But, um, you know, we, we didn't think anything much um, of autism because nobody knew about autism actually back then. After we moved, um, he developed a new uh, kind of funny skill. One day I took him into a parking lot because he was bored in synagogue and I started telling him the labels on cars. I said, oh, here's a Toyota, here's a Mazda, here's a Honda. You know, we talked, we looked at the labels on the cars and we walked around a lot, looked at the shapes of the cars. And this became an obsession. Um, and, you know, when you have a child who knows about Hondas and Toyotas and uh, all cars, all the family members think it's extremely funny to give them all gifts that pertain to cars. So his aunts and uncles gave him a, you know, book that had luxury cars. And so he would know, know Maseratis and Jaguars and crazy cars like that. But um, he became known in his preschool as the car child. Um, and this was really his major fascination. He did have a friend, but he did a lot of kind of strange social things. Wasn't, was, was obviously really kind of a different kid. And, you know, I was in graduate school at the time and I did begin to worry. 
Because I think for all of us parents, the biggest uh, question we ask ourselves is, what is my child's future going to hold? Um, and it's a, a really critical question for parents of children that are different and parents of children that are not different. Um, you know, but if you have a child that has traits of autism or is autistic, it can be really hard to predict what the future will hold because you just don't know. Um, is my child, you know, probably going to need ongoing support throughout the course of their life? Will they be able to uh, live independently from our family? Will they be able to work? Will they be able to have uh, relationships outside of our parent, our family, maybe a mate, you know, or will they just have some learning disability type issues? Um, you know, but be able to achieve those kind of adult milestones. Or on the other hand, are they going to be extremely exceptional? Because we have a lot of examples of individuals with autism who have made it into the popular consciousness as being extremely successful. You know, here's Greta Thunberg with her persistence and her um, strong views and her different way of seeing the world. She's made really quite a mark. We have Elon Musk and Bill Gates. Um, you know, I think Elon came out as being autistic on Saturday Night Live. Um, and, you know, I don't think a lot of people want to provide a lot of services for Elon Musk, but he's quite exceptional. And I think some people think Bill Gates as well is on the spectrum. So as a parent, you just don't really know. So around this time, my career was taking off. I had always wanted to be a, um, a clinician. And so I was doing my clinical hours, and lo and behold, the Mind Institute was starting up. I was very interested in this topic of autism, um, and I received one of the first Mind Scholar grants that back in the old days, uh, we took our research budget and made a lot of um, postdoctoral and uh, small grants. And so that um, was about the time that I studied, uh, I started the social skills program, um, which runs to this day under the very um, able leadership of Daniel Hayner, Meg Tudor, Romy Stanislavski. It's brought in lots of folks and trained lots of folks over the years. Um, and ultimately, uh, through the Rayleigh Teal Foundation and the Oates families, um, it's been endowed as has my chair. But um, after doing social skills for a while, um, I really became fascinated with cognitive development and was fortunate enough to secure funding from the NIH to be part of the Autism Phenome uh, Project with uh, David Amaral and Christine Nordahl. Um, and my grant was about predicting cognitive development. Um, and then I got fortunate as well in that my K08 award uh, became an R01. Um, and the cognitive control in autism or COCO study also uh, was undertaken. And I'll be talking primarily about predictors in the first half of the talk and cognitive control in autism in the second half of the talk. But I mean, one thing I want you to note is that throughout my career, I've had two prongs. I mean, on the one hand, I view myself as a scientist of behavior and even you know, a clinical cognitive neuroscientist but also I've been fortunate to be involved in the STAR trial where we conduct a clinical trial of anxiety therapy for children with autism. I was fortunate to receive funding from the Behavioral Health Center of Excellence to uh, do a validation study of a curriculum we call the ACCESS program, which is an extension of social skills. So I've been able to be involved in actual service provision. And right now you see this nice orange circle where my current passion lies, you can see, unfortunately, still no funding, but we've been trying really hard uh, to work on supported employment. As I mentioned, I was fortunate to get a grant in the context of the Autism Phenome Project. And for those of you who don't know, um, the Autism Phenome Project is what we call an inception cohort that was begun at the Mind Institute in 2006. Um, an inception cohort means that it starts at the beginning and our kids were two years old when we um, got them. And it's really turned into a perspective study, meaning that we observe people as they're aging with five time points now. Um, and it ranges from ages two to 19. The goal, and you know, I really think that the folks that were involved in the APP early on, uh, that's David, that's Sally, 
uh, Rogers were really um, uh, very uh, prescient in knowing that it was going to be extremely important to parse the heterogeneity of autism. Now it's really well known, it's so heterogeneous, but it wasn't so well known then. Um, and so the project was really intended to help understand the phenotypes of autism in the service of better understanding etiology, prognosis, interventions, and services. From the get-go, uh, the APP was billed as an extremely family-friendly study, meaning that we took very good care of the participants. Little known fact, um, I was what they called the family support coordinator back in the early days until I realized that wasn't going to really be an entree into a research career, and I went and did a K award. But, um, you know, always we've really focused on uh, keeping the families um, as part of our family. Over time, uh, it's been funded by the Mind Institute, the ARA funds, and NIH. Uh, as I mentioned, three of us, or maybe I didn't mention, three of us had ARA ones at the middle childhood period, and we're real close to three of us having ARA ones again in the um, adolescent period. We've got about 50 publications, and the APP alumni are doing great things. Some are professors, some are docs, some are clinical psychologists, clinical research uh, coordinators. Deanna went off to, uh, our love, uh, beloved project manager went off to the CDC, actually, after getting a PhD. And we even have someone working now at Google. So let's take a look at the number of families participating so you can appreciate this sample. Um, the yellow line is cumulative uh, families, which are about at 700 when you count all the different kinds of projects that have run off the different uh, um, uh, studies here, including um, the ACE projects. Uh, and we have, you can see there was a little bit of a hiatus in funding and a little bit of a fall off during the pandemic, but uh, we've been robustly uh, collecting data since 2006. Um, one of the unique qualities of the cohort is that it has a very wide range of intellectual functioning. On the top, you see uh, verbal uh, developmental quotient, on the bottom, nonverbal, and these are all at intake. Um, and you can see that the autism group really spans the whole IQ range. Um, it was made, a decision was made not to um, include developmentally disabled controls, but instead uh, typically developing controls and their IQs are a bit higher. Um, we also have a very wide range of uh, ADOS calibrated severity scores. So here too, there's a large um, uh, spread and uh, male and female participants, um, you know, we have about a total in the initial cohort four to one ratio as was uh, believed to be um, the gender ratio in autism and the sex ratio in autism. Um, now it's believed that there's actually more females and as we recruit in more people, we try to be true to that. Um, we've also uh, had with Christine Nordahl's grants um, the GAIN study, been able to recruit an additional cohort of females, pushing our female enrollment up really pretty high. Demographically, we're a little bit locked into what we had at the beginning, which is not particularly diverse, but as we um, try uh, going forward, as we recruit more people into the sample, um, we are trying to improve that. We are largely a white sample, and we're largely a non-Hispanic sample. Um, with about 7% uh, uh, Afri African Americans and um, uh, Asians. And we have a really comprehensive study protocol. Uh, I mentioned there are five time points. And uh, just to, to give you a little bit of a warning here, sometimes it gets confusing in the Autism Phenome Project to talk about time one and you know all the different time points as time one, time two, time three, et cetera. Um, time one is about ages two to three and a half. Time two, about three to five. Time three, about four to six. Time four, about nine to 12. Um, and that's where I'll be stopping today. And then our current grants that I mentioned that we're close to having three of uh, will be 15 to 19. We also don't do the complete battery at all time points. But at time one, we definitely did the full battery. And that was neurological testing, MRI essentially, behavioral assessments and questionnaires, a medical exam, biological samples of blood. Um, 
The next full battery was at this time three. Um, and then we're doing full batteries at four and five as well. Um, you know, you've probably heard about a lot of other longitudinal cohorts in the field. Um, so here at, uh, uh, at the MIND, we have the charge cohort, which is followed up by the recharge cohort. It's another inception cohort. It's a very large cohort. All the groups are larger than 100. Um, they were going to do, or we were going to do actually three time points in charge, but we haven't really been able to, um, in the recharge protocol, fit into time points. And another nice thing about the charge study is that it's an epidemiological sample. Marbles is a slightly different design, so I didn't include it here. You might have heard of the Eves and Ho study. Again, good longitudinal study, but it's not an inception cohort. It's smaller than 100 and doesn't have three time points. Um, the EU Ames project gets a lot of um, press. Uh, they've also got a LEAP study, which is twins, and a PIP study, which is young children. But initial uh, EU Ames is not an um, inception cohort, and it doesn't have three time points yet. And from what I understand from my INSAR conversations, is it's a little tough to fund across the EU at this point. IBIS, largely a young children cohort with an infancive design, uh, also um, contains behavioral and biological measures and um, has been followed up uh, several time points through ACE grants. There are other cohorts. Janet Lanehort has a cohort sequential study. Um, the PON study includes multiple neurodevelopmental disorders. The SNAP cohort uh, with our with Tony Charman and our uh, and our consultant Emily Simonoff is an adolescent study primarily. And Ditsa Zachor in Israel has done longitudinal work, um, and I believe that Elon Dinstein will be following up with his new uh, uh, BGU cohort and having a longitudinal cohort. But those aren't really as comparable as some other cohorts to the APP. I want to make the point here that the APP is really exceptional. The granddaddy of cohorts is probably Kathy Lord's cohort. That also is a prospective longitudinal cohort that's an inception study, many ages assessed. Um, actually, they're beginning to publish a lot of work in the 20s, which is real interesting, um, but no biological measurements. The California DDS cohort, also no biological measurements. Um, a, a, a Dutch cohort, a French cohort, the same. Um, no um, uh, biological measurements. Only the Autism Phenome Project, which is one of the cohorts, um, is a lot later than Kathy's cohort. So I was speaking to her at INSAR and we were talking about how the cohorts are really different because by this time, many children, 2006, many children were receiving um, early intervention and that was not the case in her cohort. Um, so again, just the APP is unique. It's got a really heterogeneous range of IQ. Uh, some of these do not. They are individuals with average or better intellectual functioning, um, but um, uh, they don't have biological me measurements. And now only our cohort is being enriched for girls as we go forward. Going back to that original question that I told you about, about investigating um, what's going to the future going to hold for my child, one of the first things I became interested in and I got funded to do was to take a look of, um, at phenotypes of IQ in the APP cohort. And that led to a paper um, that was on the top 10 in IAC's list and was published in 2018 in Autism Research. Um, I decided to focus on IQ in that paper because uh, what we know is that it's the largest contributor to the heterogeneity found in autism. It's also arguably the strongest predictor of outcomes that we know to this date. Um, we know that in typical development and also in autism, IQ increases through early childhood with the most rapid growth during the first six or seven years of life. Um, in autism, we know that associations between IQ, autism symptoms, communication, and problem behaviors like internalizing and externalizing are probably the topics that are most frequently studied when we talk about IQ. Um, and here we know that it, losing the uh, diagnosis um, of autism, something that's now believed to be possible, um, uh, thanks to the work of Deb Fine, 
um, that those, uh, those that quote unquote lose their diagnosis tend to have higher IQs. But there really isn't a lot of relationship between symptom severity and IQ. Um, we know that both verbal and nonverbal IQ are associated with later language development, which is thought to be another important predictor of, of long-term outcome. Um, and internalizing and externalizing problem behaviors are not really associated with IQ. We also know that um, one way to potentially, all these studies are based on averages across large groups and that we may be missing some of the variability and that phenotypes that are actually based on um, developmental trajectories. So that is um, the grouping is the trajectory of development may isolate subgroups that actually have similar time courses, prognoses and treatment needs and responses. But until our study, there really wasn't a multivariate study of autistic children examining longitudinal trajectories of IQ. There had been some groups that weren't as data-driven. They'd use grouping based on clinical characteristics, but we were really the first um, to employ the uh, empirical methods that we did. So we used um, developmental quotient scores. Um, and at early ages and IQ scores uh, later. Um, and developmental quotient scores are age equivalents over chronological age times 100. Um, we know one really interesting thing is that 18 children in our study at that time two, age six time point still needed to be on a different measurement. So they had DQs that were quite low and you know so low that we really couldn't differentiate them that well. Um, we did the typical forms of trajectory analysis in M plus with the typical fit indices. We used chi-square tests to evaluate group differences in categorical variables that were in the trajectories in repeated measures linear models uh, to investigate uh, baseline and developmental course differences with adjustment for multiple comparisons. And so uh, our big finding here was that there were actually four groups uh, isolated in the APP um, cohort. When you looked at this mean age three and mean age six or seven um, uh, time points, so two time points in this analysis, we found one group that we called high challenges, about 26%, and they showed intellectual disability throughout the period, uh, perhaps even a decline. Then we had a stable low group here um, that was always also in the intellectual disability range, but more stable. And then we had one really fascinating group that was uh, approximately a third of the sample. They started with um, uh, intellectual abilities in the uh, intellectual disability range, but then um, really improved two standard deviations such that they uh, were uh, functioned highly at the end. And um, then we had a lesser challenges group that was always had IQs in the average range. We took a look at ADOS changes across those four groups. You can see here, the bars represent blue is the first time point, age three, uh, time two is about uh, six or seven mean age. And we found this is the high challenges group, the stable low group, that changers group and the lesser challenges group, we found that only that lesser challenges group really showed a decline in autism symptoms. Um, and actually the stable low group showed uh, an increase in autism symptoms. Next, we looked at violent communication. Remember that was one of our hypotheses. And we saw across again, the same high challenges, stable low changers and lesser challenges groups at the age three and age six or seven time points, we saw that um, uh, most of the groups showed a increase, um, really significant, most significant increase in the changers group and a slight uh, decrease in the um, high challenges group, the, uh, the group with the highest uh, intellectual disability levels. Um, we also looked at problem behaviors through the CBCL, and we found that here, um, for externalizing, the only group that showed a significant decline was the changers group. And uh, fortunately, um, 
every group actually showed a decline, a significant decline um, in their internalizing symptoms. And this was a similar finding to that pathway study that I talked about before. So to sum up, um, Solomon et al, uh, 2018, our big findings were that there was a large group, like a third of the individuals who started with IQ levels in the intellectual disability range, you know, and saw an improvement of an average of two standard deviations, which is pretty exceptional by the time they were seven years old. Um, we saw that this is the group that had the strongest increase in adaptive communication. And this was the group that showed the declining externalizing symptoms. Um, and the lesser challenges group was the group that showed autism symptom decline. And I didn't include the other two groups here because it would have been too hard to read, but um, those were really our major take homes. Um, so uh, as we've moved into this middle childhood pre-adolescent period, the nine to 12 age range, we wanted to extend the findings of the study um, using, now that we had three data points, we could really use, do a full blown um, uh, longitudinal analysis using growth curves. Um, we wanted to replicate uh, the uh, factors that we found before to be implicated in the different trajectories. And we also wanted to better understand predictors of trajectory membership drawing upon um, developmental factors as we saw the children approaching adolescence. And here we know that social development is extremely important in adolescence. And that adolescence can be a time of an onset in psychopathology. And in particular, we were interested in depression. We also wanted to um, include some variables that are included in newer studies, including those related to IQ profiles, um, the profile of verbal and nonverbal IQ within the individual. Um, also, we were extremely interested in trying to figure out what differentiated these two groups um, that stayed in the intellectual disability range from those, this one group, uh, especially who changed and individuals that were never really in the intellectual disability range. So we looked for predictors of both early and then uh, developmental um, uh, bifurcation in these groups and predictors. Um, and this is work that was done by Billy Cho. He was a post uh, graduate student in my lab and then a postdoc. Um, and now he is our person that I mentioned who's at Google. Um, so here in the Autism Phenome Project, we took a look at time points one through three. Remember that's ages two, uh, six, and approximately uh, to 12 years. Um, and uh, we took the full sample, which um, without all those additional families added in for ACE, um, is uh, 535 individuals, of which 373 have autism and 162 have typical development. We had some individuals who only had one time point, some individuals who had two time points, and some individuals, a smaller subset, had three time points. Um, after uh, Doing analyses with and without all data, we decided we would use all data as it didn't change the results um, much at all. And we felt that it would, you know, we'd have more power if we had a, a larger sample. So the sample includes people with one, two, and three time points. Um, in this overall sample, the gender ratio is about four to one males to females because this doesn't include yet the game girls. Um, and uh, I mentioned before our IQ range in autism ranges from intellectual disability to extremely gifted, we actually have learned over time. Um, here, data analysis, we use latent class growth, latent class growth curve analysis. Um, we uh, used quadratic models, again, after looking at different models for fit. And uh, we also looked at the observed values to make sure that they fit a quadratic, and they did. Um, and so we used all available data, as I said. We used mixed effect models uh, for the trajectories of clinical characteristics for the identified subgroups. And we checked all effects um, due to bias and missing data and sample attrition. You know, as I mentioned, with, we had different amounts of data um, across. And then we used uh, multinomial logistic regression to determine the T1 
T T1 to 2 and T2 to 3 predictors of being a member of the intellectual disability versus the changers or the P high group um, at uh, the third time point. Um, our study questions, we wanted to know whether there'd still be three trajectories, the same changers, persistently intellectually disabilities, people, uh, individuals, or persistently high IQ individuals. And we hypothesized, yes, but that IQ, given what we find in typical development, would likely level off. Um, we wanted to see if those same associations between uh, clinical characteristics and trajectory membership would hold. Uh, we thought that the autism symptoms would still be lowest in the P high group, that adaptive communication growth would slow, um, and socialization would actually also decline, and that both there would lag um, IQ in the autism groups um, that had uh, average intellectual functioning. That is a finding in the literature um, that's often replicated. Um, and we all, we believe that all the groups would show increased internalizing as adolescents approached, given the onset of depression and anxiety at that time point in normative development. Um, we predicted that high early externalizing VIP, uh, VIQ, PIQ discrepancy, which has been, sorry, documented in the literature, um, and ongoing poor adaptive functioning would predict um, who stayed in the intellectual disability group versus those who went on to um, be in the groups with average or better IQs. So here's um, the results of our latent growth curve analysis. Uh, the the uh, typical group is this black line, and you can see that the green group, the P high group, which was 16% of the sample, um, ended up looking a lot like the typical group in terms of overall IQ level. The change group still showed this uh, you know, precipitous increase, although it leveled off and even maybe took a dip. And the intellectual disability group you know, pretty much stabilized. Um, and you can see, uh, you're probably wondering, how did the group sizes? We went from having four groups to three groups. Um, so here's a comparison of the groups in the later study with the groups in the 2018 subgroups. And so what you see here, these are the new groups. We renamed them. We called what we called below, uh, stay below and high challenges is now called the ID group for intellectual disability, um, the P high and the change group. Um, we saw that um, in the original changers, now two, high, um, two individuals had migrated to the P high group. Um, we saw that in this stable low group, which we now call ID, three of those individuals migrated to the change. So total of five um, individuals changed groups, so not a lot. So the groups pretty much stay the same. Um, first, we took a look at severity scores. Remember, we hypothesized that, the, uh, that this uh, high group would be the group with increasing, um, uh, uh, pardon me, decreasing autism symptoms. We didn't find that. We found that by this last time point, um, all the groups were not significantly different. Um, and there was this kind of inflection that happened here. And this inflection, um, uh, a not uh, Weisbard Bartok in our group has written a lot about trajectories of autism, uh, symptom change. And she also finds this kind of inflection here and she groups on a different variable. So our findings are, are a little bit different, but um, you know, the same notion of an inflection point uh, holds here too. Just another aside is that repetitive behaviors who've been, that have been thought by some to uh, be predictors of um, poor functioning early on, uh, the only group that really declined was the changer group. So I'm not showing that here, but I'll just let you know that. Um, in terms of violent communication and socialization, which we now looked at, um, we found that the two um, groups, uh, the changers and the P high group were not significantly different. Um, in either variable, um, and that the uh, intellectual disability group showed a significant decline between the time points. Um, uh, a little bit, it's a little bit hard to interpret here because I had to stretch out the scale so I could make them more comparable, but this often cited finding that in individuals with autism with average IQs, um, adaptive functioning is far lower than would be expected based on IQ. And you can see here for the typical group, which is the black group here, 
IQ and adaptive functioning really track each other. It's about 110 for both. But if you take a look at our two groups here um, that no longer have intellectual disability, their adaptive functioning is a lot lower than their IQ. Um, whereas for here, at least early on, and this is another often cited finding, individuals with intellectual disability tend to show um, violence scores that are in excess of their IQs. Um, although that difference disappeared over time. Um, externalizing, uh, there really was no difference in externalizing over time in the three groups. Um, although there was a, a, a decrease, a significant decrease in this um, changers group only, and that continued. Internalizing, the only group that actually changed there was, um, we thought that all groups would increase. The typical group did increase, but not significantly. Um, only the uh, ID group decreased, the intellectual disability group uh, decreased. Um, which uh, was not so surprising, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, however, you know, the internalizing index is comprised of multiple things, one of which is pure anxiety and depression. And here we saw that, um, that there was a precipitous increase in those two uh, groups with average or better IQs in the autism group, and much less so in the group with intellectual disability. So not uh, widespread across the board. And this is actually the inspiration for our renewed adolescence grant. So to sum up here, um, the results of the multinomial logistic regression, um, we called any kind of uh, predictor from time one or even before time one, so at age two or before, a early or a risk marker. We called any, um, T1 to T2 changes or T3 to T3 changes, those childhood changes, developmental markers. And here for early risk markers, we found that both um, the change group and the P high group, if you had higher um, early Vineland communication, you were more likely to be in that group. Um, we also found that as a developmental marker, the same was true, that changers and P high, if they had early high scores, they were much less likely to be in the intellectually disabled group at the end of the period. And the same held for socialization. We did find that T1 to T2 change in externalizing was predictive of being in the change group versus the intellectual disability group. Um, and that individuals with the highest nonverbal IQ discrepancy um, to verbal IQ discrepancy, and we just define this as one and a half standard deviations. So those with higher um, nonverbal IQ were at greater risk to be in the intellectual disability group. Um, another interesting finding, although we didn't find early intervention being associated with development, we did find that um, those with the highest levels of intellectual disability um, were receiving more uh, intensive intervention by uh, late middle childhood. So to sum up, the autism group with three trajectories um, were similar to those in the 2018 study. And the non-autistic group really only had one trajectory, which is pretty fascinating. Autism symptoms no longer differ by group or change differentially, although repetitive behaviors did decline, at least at the beginning of that period in the changers. Um, change, um, actually it's from the whole period in the changers. Change caught up to P high in adaptive communication and socialization, but P low socialization um, and communication did decrease. In externalizing symptoms declined over time in the changers, but not the other groups. Um, internalizing and anxiety and depression symptoms increased in the P high and the change groups, if you looked at that, um, the really anxious depression scale and declined for the intellectual disability group. Early markers for staying in the intellectual disability versus change or P high were poor communication and social adaptive functioning and a large NDIQ to verbal IQ discrepancy um, at time one. Improved socialization and communication adaptive functioning are developmental markers of becoming a member of change or P high and those with higher intervention intensity were more likely to be in the ID group. 
So kind of uh, discussion and next steps, uh, as I did mention, um, middle childhood may be an inflection point for some areas of development. Um, large, and, and there we would assume that probably the challenges of childhood and school increase, and that just um, explains autism symptoms. Um, it just shows, makes them more evident. Um, now, you also will note that it's probably not purely a measurement error because it didn't, uh, it didn't occur for all variables. Um, large increases with anxiety and depression symptoms in more able autistic individuals is really concerning. Um, low, we know that lower levels of these symptoms in less autistic individuals um, may be a result of measurement issues, which we learned working with our consultant, uh, Connor Kearns, um, uh, uh, when we, we looked at um, anxiety symptoms and found that it's very difficult to uh, actually measure these kinds of symptoms in individuals who don't have as much language. Um, early uh, risk markers, externalizing adaptive communication and social functioning and developmental markers, communication and social functioning actually offer potential leads for risk prediction and for intervention. Um, we can uh, intervene on um, adaptive functioning and it's something we don't do a lot, but we probably should uh, do that more. Um, and you know, it's very, uh, very tantalizing to think about neuroimaging investigation and to try to differentiate the groups that way. So uh, here is some work that was done by Josh uh, Lee, who's a member of uh, Christine Nordahl's group and also uh, the APP cohort. Um, and what Josh has done is he's investigated, um, he wanted to predict and see if using T1 brain volume measurements um, in ROIs, regions of interest that are associated with um, IQ, if there were any differences in our three trajectory groups. Um, so uh, we know that the frontal parietal network has been often associated with IQ. And so he identified 22 regions of interest in this uh, frontal parietal network from the Smith et al. parcellation. Um, and default mode network is another region that's attracted a lot of attention recently as being a region um, that if there's poor coordination between uh, frontal parietal network and the default mode network, um, it doesn't uh, augur well for uh, intellectual functioning or cognitive functioning in general. So um, he looked, he used a, a unique method called multivariate distance matrix regression, MDMR, which is a person-centric multivariate regression model. Um, that's been used a lot with high density data sets, uh, things like genomic data, connectomic data, and now this brain region data. Um, and it's an index that actually represents how much individuals differ with respect to each other across a set of outcomes. So here our outcome is the brain volumes in that network. It uses a unique visualization metric uh, shows centroids for each group and circles around or ellipses around the centroids that are scaled to standard deviation. And there's a way to calculate the relative effect sizes of the index indices themselves. So here we found, here Josh found in that frontal parietal network that the persistent high group showed um, the, uh, there they were um, most, uh, the most differentiated using this index of how those uh, measures in the frontal parietal volumes hung together um, versus the other two groups. And you can see that there was a lot of variance given the size of the ellipsoid, but they were you know, far off in how those regions behaved similar, similarly. Um, when we looked at the effect sizes, um, actually it was interesting to me that the greatest effect sizes were not in the prefrontal cortex necessarily, but were in regions in the occipital cortex in the back of the brain in, in some regions in the parietal networks. Um, looking at the default mode network, it's not actually as clear from this graphic, but we did find here that the changers differed significantly from these other groups, uh, leading us to interpret that perhaps something going on here is a consent compensatory mechanism that's going to lead them later on to develop uh, into being in the persistently high group. And here, the greatest effects were actually in middle temporal gyrus. Um, and you know, here, language and sensory processing has been associated there. Okay, 
Now I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to talk about um, the other study that I mentioned. That's also a study of cognitive development, um, the COCO study. And here, um, our goals were to actually look through adolescence um, and to see if we could, uh, using a cohort sequential design, so another form of a longitudinal design, look at developmental trajectories of behavioral measures of cognitive control um, in autistic and non-autistic participants from adolescence into young adulthood. Let me just quickly say that cognitive control is a metric that really emanates from the field of cognitive neuroscience. Um, it's similar to executive functions or executive control. Um, however, it's been more empirically validated um, using uh, fMRI and other methods um, so that we're rather than being based in lesion studies that are one point in time kind of studies, um, we're able to look at cognitive control over time using functional imaging uh, metrics and we're able to uh, test hypotheses, um, unlike being able to, you know, more actively than using a lesion model. Um, and we were really interested in using imaging here to look at two different types of cognitive control. Um, one is proactive cognitive control, and proactive cognitive control is the ability to hold a situation's context online um, in advance of having to make a response, where more reactive control means that your prefrontal cortex isn't working as well, um, and that you have to really bring on your memory and other regions later, you know, and in those default mode kind of regions later um, in uh, in a task to be able to complete the task and that you're just not really as well prepared. And those proactive has been more associated with prefrontal cortex um, and uh, reactive more adjustments between the anterior cingulate and uh, regions of the prefrontal cortex. Finally, the area I'm gonna talk most about today is investigating associations between behavioral and neural indices of cognitive control and functional and mental health outcomes. And I'd like to say that this work was really influenced a lot um, by my, uh, my KO8 award in Camp Carter's lab, uh, which studies psychotic disorders. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, I gained knowledge of proactive and reactive control, really uh, following after that field that um, has been ahead of our field. And also they've done a very nice job of being able to understand adult behavior, something which we haven't done as good a job yet um, at measuring and uh, predicting. I uh, also wanna say that these little cute animals here are official Coco logo. Um, they are the drawings of an autistic man who's now about 35 um, named Aton. And we have them adorning our cups and our prizes to our participants. Um, the Coco study design, as I mentioned, was cohort sequential or accelerated longitudinal. And that means in three assessments over a five-year period, we can develop a curve that allows us to make inferences, a growth curve that allows us to make inferences um, across a 12 to 26-year-old age period. So when we started, our participants were 12 to 22. Um, at time two, we saw the same participants back. And I have to say, we had a very high retention rate, about 86%. Um, and in time three, we recruited a subsample of those original participants back in there too. We did quite well um, with our retention. And we are in the process now of completing um, the recruitment of these new individuals that'll fill in the lower end of the growth curves here. Um, and uh, we are about two thirds of the way done uh, with that. Um, so the analyses I'm gonna report aren't really at this point longitudinal. Um, they come from uh, time points one and two, but we're really looking forward to being able to do more longitudinal analysis. So spoiler alert, uh, from this grant, looking at aims one and two and looking at time points one and two, we really didn't find that there were as many cognitive control differences as, I thought that, as we thought there were going to be. So in a first study that used data from both APP and our, um, our grant, we found that proactive control that we hypothesized would be weaker in autism was not really weaker, but that in fact, it was associated with having better cognitive control, better attention, so less ADHD symptoms and more repetitive behaviors. 
Um, we followed this up with a study looking at um, another really fine-grained cognitive science task of proactive and reactive control, and again, found no proactive and reactive differences across the groups. Although we did find here that proactive control was associated with um, depression, and this is the work of Marie Crew, um, who was very influential in all of this work. Um, finally, a paper by Andrew Gordon was another postdoc in our lab. Uh, after Jeremy Hogami, um, we did another test uh, of cognitive control automatic imitation, a motoric cognitive control test, and again, didn't find great differences. Um, however, I used behavioral measures in the toolbox, and I did find that individuals with autism in this neuropsych measure did show um, uh, fluid cognition differences versus uh, people with typical development and I grouped uh, individuals with autism. Um, we, uh, that was pretty much our studies related to AIM-1. Uh, related to AIM-2, we did some work looking at the dual mechanisms, the proactive, reactive. And again, we found that there were some subtle differences, but maybe not as strong as we expected. Maybe our cognitive control was a bit delayed in the autism group, but um, we were surprised by that. Um, we also took a look at memory, another, area. Again, not too many great differences. Um, uh, finally, we did find some more affective differences looking at insula um, retrospranial cortex that was, uh, was associated, reductions in connectivity was associated with uh, reduced insight in autism. Um, but what I want to tell you about now is two smaller studies that we're in the process of writing up that tackled that issue of the um, behavior and measuring behavior. Um, doubling back to the work I showed you in the APP cohort and what we saw about adaptive functioning and how important it is for predicting outcomes, um, I want you to understand that adaptive functioning has a life course. And in my schizophrenia travels, I learned that adaptive functioning, um, the term really used in adulthood is more functional outcomes, at least that's the term that's used in, um, in the psychotic disorders literature to describe adults and how they're functioning in adulthood. Um, so you can see here, you know, the kind of skills that a small child would need um, or even a school-aged child would need or a teenager would need to function well in their developmental environment are probably pretty different from those required to go to work, you know, or, or go to school. Um, and we don't have a lot of good measures to use to predict. So I've always been fond of using this little um, analogy of a bridge uh, to, that spans the brain behavior divide. Um, here we have cognition and it would be so great to be able to take cognition and you know, predict what's gonna happen in adulthood, but there's this big divide. Um, and the divide uh, is uh, really in part due to a lot of the measurement issues. So we know that a lot of you know, questionnaire measurements um, is generally what we use. The Vineland is what we used in the APP. Here we use the ABAS-3 uh, in uh, our studies of older individuals. Um, and it's an experimental measure. Um, uh, pardon me, the questionnaires can be very biased. Even you know, with the ABASs, as we have parents and children reporting, that becomes a real difficult issue too because they don't record, uh, they don't have great concordance in their reports. Um, experimental measures like some of the tasks that I use to measure cognitive control, like the ones we used in those studies, they are really far from behavior. And as the field has developed, um, there's been uh, a lot kind of better results, um, you know, correlating uh, brain behavior with using questionnaires like the brief, which is a, an executive function kind of a questionnaire. However, you know, it is potentially very biased. Um, because it's all parent report or self-report. Um, another problem that's been raised recently, and this came out a lot at, in Kathy Lord's work and also in, at INSAR, if you listen to the talk by Liz Pelicano, that our outcome measures are really sterile um, and they don't capture autistic flourishing. So, you know, um, they might capture skills, but we don't know what it takes to live a good life. And that's really very, very, very critically important. Um, so the schizophrenia field taught me that using performance-based measures and, you know, the work of Phil Harvey might be a better bet. So we've started to work uh, using some of those, these measures. So um, our intrepid 
uh, research um, assistant of four years, Rachel Wolf, who's going to be going to UNC to do a public health degree uh, shortly, um, was very, very interested in uh, Phil Harvey, our colleague I was mentioning, I think he has an SBIR grant, developed a program called iFunction, which is both an assessment and an intervention for adaptive functioning. So we conducted a pilot study in 25 autistic and 25 non-autistic adults ages 15 to 24, and these individuals did not have intellectual disability. Um, now, eye function is a cool task, and I'm going to show you what the screen looks like in a minute, but it's computer-based simulation of daily tasks. There are six modules um, that are available currently. We chose two that were most appropriate to our population, but new modules are being developed all the time. Um, now, we just looked at the assessment piece itself, but um, the modules can be used in a uh, sort of a staircasing and adaptive function, uh, adaptive manner to uh, teach people skills, teach the individual at the level that they are ready to learn at. Um, so our study questions in this very preliminary little pilot study were, um, is it feasible to administer this? Does it differentiate autistic and non-autistic persons? Um, and do the scores uh, behave the way we would expect and correlate with other measures? Um, here's the eye function task. Here's a little sample screen from the ATM module that asks you to check your ATM balance um, and gives you an ATM number and you have to press the right buttons to make all that happen. And here's a ticket purchase where you have to buy a one-way metro ticket from the airport to the center of town and you have to push the right buttons there too. So very real life type uh, tasks. Um, and in a paper now uh, under review at Autism in Adulthood, I, it's actually been resubmitted again, um, we found that all that one participant could complete this task, that the task did differentiate um, between the groups uh, with respect to error rates, with the autism group making more errors than the non-autistic group, and that error rates were associated with composite scores um, on the ABAS. So this, these two little tasks that measure very discrete skills was were predictive of the whole ABAS composite, which I thought was really interesting, as well as the practical and community use scores, which are a little closer to what this measures. Um, regression analyses showed that age was associated with lower error rates and that NIH uh, toolbox cognition scores predicted, so cognitive abilities, if we want to predict, again, using cognitive abilities, um, predict performance in autistic, but not autistic participants. Um, and that was above and beyond IQ, which was not a predictor. So we're excited. We think this is potent, has potential as an ecologically valid um, and um, a direct measurement of adaptive functioning slash functional outcomes. Um, and that there may be some feasibility to an uh, adaptive functioning program. Um, next, uh, Dewey, Dewey Wynn, who's been a, um, a medical student with us for the last three or four years, getting ready to graduate and go on, um, hopefully gonna stay with us though, is, um, has been also working on an ecologically valid and direct measure of cognitive capacity and executive functions called the MAP task where participants have to com complete a list of errands during a shopping trip um, in a timely manner. Um, here, the outcome indices are times, errands, total errors, and there's different types of errors. Um, you know, here too, we sought to see if they would differentiate the participants, correlate with other measurements, and be associated um, with a questionnaire measure of adaptive functioning. So here's the MAP test. Here's the picture they see. They have concrete instructions. These instructions are read to them. They have to do things in a very specific order. You can see this little map. They get to park and they get to do all these errands and they have to show you on the map where they're gonna go next and they get graded and if they listen to all the rules and uh, do things in the correct order, which they don't. Um, and here we had 73 participants with autism. Everyone and typical development, we used an IQ match. We used an IQ matched sample um, and uh, um, full scale IQ um, was matched as a result of that. And ADOS uh, score is obviously not, uh, not right for the typical group. And we found here, um, these, are, these bars represent 
the variables on the task, um, they're kind of hard to see. So let me tell you, this is total errors for both the tip group and the green, the autism group. Um, total uh, time taken, errands, and a capacity score. And we found significant differences between the groups in that capacity score, which is an overall index, and also in total errors. Um, when we did a blow up of the different kinds of errors, we found a really interesting pattern um, that the autistic group made more er ordering errors. So they went to places in the wrong order. And that is not a pattern that our friends who were working in the schizophrenia field had found um, in their sample. Um, we also found that the capacity score was associated with a medium effect size with both fluid cognition on the toolbox um, and crystallized cognition. So more a measure of uh, cognitive flexibility and maybe language, flexible language. Um, and it was also um, associated with one of the uh, ABAS composites um, that measured the ability to do tasks basically and follow directions. So here, it's a hybrid cognition and adaptive functioning measure that can be used um, across the whole group. It can discriminate the autistic and non-autistic groups. Um, the autism group exhibit this really interesting sequential ordering error, um, which really may discriminate it. This is kind of an exciting, uh, our schizophrenia colleagues who've been working with us on this and their names were listed previously, um, also may discriminate uh, clinical high risk from autistic individuals. Um, and that's actually kind of interesting because there's a lot of talk, especially in that literature, about the co-occurrence of um, autism traits and uh, clinical high risk for developing psychotic disorders. So it could be a differentiating factor, this difference in ordering versus other um, types of errors. Um, and it was associated with measures of cognition, adaptive functioning as we expected, and that provides some support for its construct validity. Now here, I'm just gonna say a very, very few words about what we'd like to do next in um, uh, COCO which is, um, uh, a, uh, is um, we're, we're trying to renew the grant currently. And this is all more on the side of parsing cognition, uh, again, using neuroscience measures, but also um, now more participative measures. Um, we have uh, seen and read in the literature, there's this light motif that cognition can be parsed by looking at information processing styles. And very simply, this autistic style focuses on more single pieces of information while a non-autistic style is said to incorporate a lot of consideration of relationships between pieces of information. And this is largely the work of Laurent Motron's group and Michelle Dawson herself, a woman with autism. So when you have a focus on single pieces of information, you're really good at focusing on details and memorizing details and accumulating and memorizing information. If you have more of a so-called non-autistic style, and people can have both, um, you tend to focus more on whole versus parts, have stronger episodic memory, um, are a little bit uh, more holistic in your integration of perception and behavior, um, and you're better at naturally hierarchically organizing information. But what we want to show here is that both of these styles have exceptional characteristics. And some people have both of them. And so those uh, called by Dawson, people that have cognitive versatility have both. So they can really remember a depth of facts, but they learn to organize them hierarchically. And that's just really a winning style. Um, and so this is more of a science kind of a question that we wanna implement looking at cognition. And we have a lot of hypotheses about the prefrontal cortex and what role it might play in these kinds of information processing styles. But I want to make you aware in the last part of my talk of a sobering reality. Um, and this, you may be familiar with this new book called Healing Our Path from Mental Illness by Mental Health by our former colleague, Tom Insel, who has been quoted several times as saying that he spent 13 years at NIMH. He loved pushing the genetics and neuroscience, but he really thinks um, he's gotten uh, succeeded in getting a lot of very cool papers published by cool scientists. And uh, incidentally, that's us um, being, we're very cool scientists being published at a high cost 
we really haven't moved the needle in terms of some of these really important outcomes like suicide, hospitalizations, um, et cetera. So I would uh, argue that one of the things that we can do to really move the needle in our folks with autism is improving their ability to work. Because work um, has been called the best treatment for mental health. Um, being uh, productive is a basic human need, can both be a way out of poverty and prevent entry into the disability system. And competitive employment, that is employment um, with uh, typically developing individuals as well as non-typically developing individuals um, in uh, a setting that pays you minimum wage can have a positive impact on self-esteem, life satisfaction, and reducing mental symptoms. And this is really, a lot of this is the work of these authors, Bond and Drake, who wrote a curriculum many years ago uh, when working with individuals with chronic mental illness. So as we know, in autism, the problem is that there's many, many individuals who have autism that now it's been called a tsunami are graduating high school. Um, and the, their outcomes look really bleak. At this point in California, 40% are put in day programs or sheltered workshops. Um, maybe some find their way into these autism at work companies are really very, very high work, you know, highly skilled work settings, but a lot of them are chronically unemployed or underemployed, employed in non-competitive jobs, um, or not um, in jobs that match their skills or interests. This is really a big problem because competitive integrated employment is mandated by federal law. A lot of um, people were overlooking it for a while, but it seems to be being enforced now. Um, and we also just know that this concept of flourishing, that from what we learn in other fields, meaningful work is the most important determinant of general adult well-being. Um, but our field doesn't really have an evidence-based model. Um, we saw this in our COCO study where we have begun to develop. Um, we have a bunch of measures of work that we're beginning to analyze now. And we see that even from the get-go at about age 17, individuals with autism um, don't work as much. Uh, 75, 78% of them versus only 45% haven't had a work experience by age 17 and they really don't believe in themselves. I mean, people who thought that they would have difficulty um, with autism, you know, are, uh, they are just not certain that they can work without supports. Um, so uh, I mentioned Bond and Drake, they developed this model called Individualized Placement and Support or IPS, which has been really uh, extensively studied, disseminated and validated, mostly in chronic mental health populations, but also, other populations, and there has been a small study in autism as well, where it's very sad. It's, it, it had very high levels of satisfaction. It was very successful. But here in California, we really need to engage key stakeholders in helping us adapt the model, and almost more importantly, to helping unite the many silos that have governed um, provision of employment in our state, um, and really have led to an inability to um, many, we have many one-off programs, but no real evidence-based program that's implemented throughout to a large portion of those 60% individuals, those who aren't necessarily regional center clients. And then the science part of me wants to implement and evaluate it in, uh, in the community. It's not rocket science IPS. We want to focus on competitive employment. We don't want to leave anyone out if they want to work. We wanna pay attention to um, attention to skills and preferences, not just placing people where they don't wanna be placed. We wanna begin job search right away. So job employment specialists are critical to this model because we wanna place people in their jobs before we spend time uh, in lengthy training. And here, I think we all know there's projects like Project Search where you spend a lot of time in high school um, going to classes and <clears throat> doing internships. They don't necessarily lead to employment. Um, even the search model that's been adapted for autism. There's also a lot of other one-offs and a lot of great attempts by our colleagues, Mary Baker Erickson, um, to teach social skills more broadly. Uh, Matt Smith has a very cool interview, job interview program, but there's not really one supported employment model. Um, and another thing is people very much fear losing their, uh, their benefits and their government entitlement. So IPS includes education about how to work and still be entitled to these. 
Um, they follow individuals uh, long term, providing supports when needed and fading out when they're not. Um, and, you know, kind of a panacea would really, in chronic mental health, of course, we need to integrate with other client services. But the fact that, you know, most of our individuals with autism or, you know, a good portion of them won't need ongoing mental health services, but some do, it would be wonderful to be able to wrap it with mental health. Good news, uh, autistic persons on the job can be really successful. They pay a lot of attention to detail. They have a lot of knowledge. They can be logical. They have less concern for uh, what others may think of them at the water cooler. They're independent, loyal and honest, and some of them don't mind repetitive work. Um, so uh, conclusions from my work today, the future's bright, I think, for many children diagnosed with autism. We're getting better at predicting for whom intellectual growth may be more rapid. rapid. We're not good at accurately assessing intellectual growth in those who might be a little slower, but we're working on that. Um, adaptive skills, our colleague Dave Hessel with his work with the Stanford Binet um, and our ACE colleagues. Um, adaptive skills uh, are highly associated with uh, uh, better outcomes. And can we take a holistic life scale, lifespan approach to try to better measure and better remediate? Um, we want to take, uh, be sure to have mental health efforts to stave off rapid increases in mental health concerns that may onset in adolescence. And finally, we want to really implement working system of supported employment and better target jobs to autistic individuals and their unique skills. And just to say, it's a science problem, but probably more importantly, it's a community problem and it's a systems problem. So you might be interested. I started the arc of this talk with where my eldest, uh, with my child, uh, telling you about him. Um, so now uh, my child is uh, 32 and she is a she and a her uh, as opposed to a he. Um, things got better. Uh, for her after going to a new middle school, graduated college, uh, became a South Asian studies major and was successful at this highly detailed um, job working at Brookings, um, was published in Foreign Affairs, a magazine that's world famous, um, and always wanted to work in residential computing and car blogging throughout, still loving cars. She married her soulmate um, and then worked at Epic to the, to the scorn of many relatives and friends that you know, computer, the company we all love to hate. Um, and now is an internet infrastructure, uh, what they call a customer success manager, where she works in technical accounts, was just promoted. Um, when I asked her a little bit about why she thinks she's successful at her job, she gave me an answer that was quite similar to what I mentioned as cognitive versatility. You know, she mentioned being able to really memorize everything about clients, program, you know, projects, having to learn to actually impose a hierarchical structure to learn how to separate the wheat from the chaff, if you will, and know what was important, but then to import those knowledge structures across all the clients that she works with. Um, and I was so proud when she used her technical skills to help close down websites during January 6th, storming of the Capitol, um, and hopefully uh, helped to get some uh, prosecutions. Um, she identifies as neurodiverse and continues to love golf, scotch, luxury goods, trivia, identifying samples and rap songs, and we hope for family. So I'd like to thank all my grantors, participants, you guys, I ran a little long, um, and uh, my many colleagues that have participated in this work over time, um, ranging from people who are been members of my lab to my APP collaborators um, and my COCO co-investigators. So thanks very much. Thank you for a wonderful talk, Marjorie. I, I, you know, personally, I really appreciate your integration of kind of basic neuroscience and cognitive science approaches with this focus on functional outcomes. I think that's really unique and, and very exciting. So thank you for that. And there are a few questions. And so I'm going to go ahead and ask as many as I can in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So uh, one question was, could you count? So this is back on the, on the predictors, your first part of your talk. Um, could you comment on the interaction between communication skills and the reliability of IQ testing in early age? I think the idea being here is, you know, uh, is improvement in cooperation and understanding. Does that contribute to increased uh, IQ values in the changer group? I think that, the, that there is a lot of evidence in the literature that would suggest that that's the case. 
um, understand that really some of the best measures we had here were adaptive functioning measures. So I think one thing that's kind of interesting that comes out of that is that adaptive functioning measures are really better predictors at an early age than IQ function. So I think if a child can do a lot of things that might have had a bad day when they had their um, language assessment, but um, the question, which is a really good question, you really couldn't answer it so well, given how small our group is actually when you look at it and given the, the measures that we had. But I would certainly say there've been a lot of groups, Kathy Lord, for instance, who will say that IQ is the most important predictor, um, but we'll also look for more subtle relationships between language and functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And then another question, again, this is focused on the first part of the talk. I mean, are there, Kind of looking back, are there other uh, potential indicators of growth or risk that you wish you would have had so that you could look at other predictors of these cognitive trajectories? Um, well, you know, we don't, um, we haven't, I mean, we still have time to do it. Um, we can actually uh, take a look uh, better, I think, as I'm, I'm thinking on the fly here, but take a look at some of the Vineland items and take a look at some of the, the domains of the Vineland, which haven't been um, as uh, neatly parsed. There's usually a social domain and a communication domain and a daily living skills um, domain of uh, the two measures that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think we could take a look more at items and see if there are some item level things that would be predictive um, of better adaptive functioning. There's been some recent work on uh, sex differences in adaptive functioning and its role in predicting outcomes. So I think we have more work to do. Um, actual measures that I wish I had, um, I actually think we have a lot of measures. I, you know, I wish we had maybe, um, when you get into this work of parsing individuals, you do end up with small groups. So if we have subgroups, you have small groups. And you know, some of them are always smaller than the others. And those are, of course, the ones you want to study most yeah. as things happen. So I think having a larger sample, and that's what we're in the process of doing, would be also quite helpful. Great. Thank you. Um, just uh, another question was uh, the, the finding of uh, early intervention intensity as uh, a predictor of shifts um, it was really interesting. Um, do you have any measures of kind of quality of schooling, you know, post early intervention to know whether the, the nature of whether there's people are in inclusive classrooms or whether there's any sort of measure of academic quality, if that has any effect? Um, I'm we're in several of the studies that I'm working on, we've taken and we've adapted this uh, collective programs of excellence in autism intervention record. Um, so early on, we've only had an intervention record. But um, that record does have a lot of different uh, types of intervention. Um, you know, ABA due to its intensity, that, that measure gets weighted by, how, by the ratio of students to teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there, ABA tends to swamp out everything else. And so that measure I showed you um, is a measure essentially of ABA, those who received ABA because it's the most intensive. Um, later on in some of our studies, so in my study, the COCO study, we did add in measures of schooling and the charge, uh, recharge study is now the schooling. So I think there definitely are measures we could look at. And in the middle childhood APP, we do have school achievement measures as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll be taking some time to look at those two. We have lots more to look at. Um, I, another question uh, that came up was whether or not um, there are any other uh, biomarkers uh, that are available in the APP uh, data set so that you can look at those as predictors of these kind of different profiles that emerge in terms of the IQ trajectories? There definitely are, and we want to do that in a hypothesis-driven way. You know, again, um, some of our data collection, when you go to parse groups, can get small, but we certainly have done a lot of work um, in in parsing um, and, and showing different associations with different kinds of trajectories ranging from anxiety and amygdala growth. And um, there are more things we can look at related to IQ. The paper by Josh was really just a first, a first start. And we were just talking yesterday about needing to use more resting state data that we do have to take a look. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of a flip side of that was uh, a question about whether or not, and you may have mentioned this, whether or not there were uh, kind of socioeconomic factors or other social demographic factors that were related to these different profiles that emerged in terms of the IQ trajectory groups? 
Um, there were no socioeconomic differences across the groups, which is good news. Um, and uh, um, making sure that I'm stating that correctly. I believe that that is correct. Otherwise we would have reported them and they wouldn't have ended up in the supplemental information. And I would remember them glaringly as being bad things we needed to change. <laughs> Okay, so here's a, um, another question. It's a little bit longer, so I'm just going to read this as is. Uh, so I'm intrigued by the nonverbal IQ uh, greater than verbal IQ predictor of low IQ and functioning. Related to another question, nonverbal IQ can be very complex in terms of the intellectual abilities represented. So is the later IQ simply overly weighted towards the verbal communication skills? And would this differ for those who have been uh, who have been trained in using the adaptive communication tools or sign sign language. So I guess um, it's really a question about kind of the shifting uh, focus of the intelligence test itself in terms of higher proportion of verbal items. Um, you know, I think that, you know, using this as an index, this over preponderance, this big discrepancy, it was a little bit of a surprise to us. Most people argue that it's verbal abilities that predict going forward, but we actually did not find that. We found instead it was this discrepancy. Mm -hmm. um, and there has been a lot of literature on discrepancy now, some of it arguing one way and some of it arguing another, although I think we're the first one to look at the relative. And of course, that could be one of the things that's going on. Um, you know, I just think it's kind of a risk marker and maybe something that people ought to keep their eye on if they see that that pattern exists. And you can see that it's, while I call it a risk marker, it's not a developmental marker. So the person asking the question may very well be right. And those things may change over time and, and cease to be as important. Um, and we did, I don't recall, I think we did look at it developmentally, but that would be an interesting thing to look at again. We did look at it by group. And of course, the, that pattern of real discrepancies is not found in uh, typically developing children to nearly the same extent. I believe that's in the manuscript too. Okay. Um, th this is a question, there are a couple of questions about the anxiety depression findings. Um, uh, and this one is about the emergence of anxiety and depression in individuals with the higher cognitive functioning. Do you have any hypothesis about uh, why and that, what that relationship means and whether there's anything about the brain basis of that relationship? Um, so I think from a, behavioral point of view, um, we, we know that, I mean, first of all, that finding isn't so unique. A lot of other studies of the emergence of depression have shown that that's the case, that depression is you know, a, a risk factor in people with autism um, during that time period. Um, and I think that it's typically thought that higher language abilities, you know, it's a little bit of a tautology, but our IQ trajectories pick up higher language abilities, generally speaking, that the ability to, you know, perceive more around you, talk more to yourself, um, think things through might be associated with the ability to worry more, you know, however, um, I, you know, an anticipatory worry is another part of anxiety and it just might help you to be better at that, which is ironically worse. You know, I would caution folks um, in saying that we can't count out the people who don't have as much spoken language as not having anxiety because, you know, we saw that using, even just using our, um, our ATIS interview, the gold standard interview with parents, we were able to show a great difference and a higher anxiety level than we did using questionnaires because people simply just don't know whether their kids are anxious or not. Um, with respect to um, the question about uh, biological, um, issues, you know, I think that's something we are going to be looking looking at as we move now into adolescence and, you know, see what's going on. We haven't yet looked at some of the things that could be associated with um, the emergence of depression. I think actually Christine's um, R1 may be tackling that and we're cer certainly looking at it. We're using a task-based paradigm to look at um, amygdala development in the individuals who become more, um, who become more uh, anxious over time. And then uh, maybe we can end with this. This is less. This is not a question, but more of a of a comment, and and perhaps a, a new career path for you. <laughs> so it's a great talk, uh, particularly around the future directions uh, uh, and the focus on jobs for all. Uh, maybe your next career path has to include a political component as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Whoever who wrote that? <laughs> no. uh, I'm, I'm not naming names, but, okay. but I, 
Yeah, but you know, I, I, obviously, one of the things that that we all worry about is is kind of the the poor outcomes in the data that you presented, a poor poor kind of opportunity outcomes for people uh, for autistic individuals in terms of employment, things like that, and that really uh, is uh, troubling for all of us because one would expect maybe that employment will also lead to uh, better trajectories of mental health symptoms and perhaps better trajectories of cognitive growth after as well as you continue to be engaged. And that, that, that's my point. You know, it's a pretty cheap intervention good yeah. for society, good for yeah. families and uh, good for people with autism. I would argue we know that that's the case in so many others and the, you know, initial literature on autism suggests the same. So, yeah. Um, big systems problem. Uh, I think it's a game changer that um, uh, WIOFA has now been implementing, is really being implemented. So competitive integrated employment is really the law of the land and people are having to get with the program. Um, I think unfortunately in our state, a lot of people don't even get into the pipelines because if you are a regional center client, it's a lot easier for you to become a DOR client. If you're super, super, super able, you can probably, you know, get a job without a lot of, with some external assistance, we all need help, but it's easier to get a job, you know, and potentially a competitive job, but there's this large group that we've seen so much in my studies of individuals who take a long time to launch, mm -hmm. you know, and there might not be as many things for them. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.